Dogs for the Saturday. Um, so, a little bit about me. Uh, my name's Liz Lee. I, uh, my handle is Liz Lux. Um, that's my GitHub username if you want to download these slides later on. I am a front-end developer at Wikimedia, and I am the head of the front-end coding inventions team there. So, um, my goal for this talk is that you two can have a JavaScript style guide in less than six months, which is about how long it took us, but it shouldn't have to take that long. So, a little bit um, about Wikia, just to give you guys some background is that we, uh, we call ourselves the social universe for fans by fans. Um, what I like to say is that you can create your own wiki and we'll host it for you. Um, we have lots of entertainment and gaming wikis, so you may have heard of us, especially if you play video games. Um, so there's lots of great things about Wikia. We're open source, communities open, um, so we do an idea of our scale. We have 400,000 wikis and about 100 million monthly users. That's our Mascot Falcor, he's awesome. Um, but we also have some challenges. Um, so we're built on MediaWiki. We're basically a very heavily customized version of Wikipedia. Um, and anytime you work on a third-party platform, there's going to be challenges extending their code um, and keeping their code tidy. Um, so we've also had some growth in the last four years. We've increased our employees by 600%. Um, so anytime you have growth like that, it's difficult to um, maintain coding conventions from your year if you don't have time to set up all of um, Also, historically, we've considered us to be kind of a scrappy startup. Uh, we have really have more uh, back-end focused engineers and generalists, and no one really focusing on the front end for a long time. Um, so there were lots of issues. Um, we were having all of these long, drawn-out conversations without anywhere to point to that says, this is actually the way we write JavaScript here at Wikia. Um, and so I complained. Um, for about two years, I complained. <laughs> and you know what they say about the squeaky wheel? And she gets to lead the JavaScript coding convention group. Um, so we put together a group of about four of us engineers, um, and we had a mission. As a developer, I want a clear and well-documented guide covering coding conventions, patterns, and best practices for JavaScript development at Wikia, along with tools to help me in making my code compliant. Um, so that was our mission, that's what we set out to do. Um, and in order to do that, I have found that we relied on these three key principles. The first one is uh, trust the code. And if you don't trust the code, Get to a point where you can trust your code. You want to be able to trust your code. So here's an example of some untrustworthy code. Sorry, it's a little small. Um, basically, uh, we're using jQuery in our stack. And what this code is doing is, it is, if you're familiar with jQuery, you already probably know what's wrong with this code. Um, but what it's doing is it's querying the DOM for an element with an ID of foo. And then it's adding a class of active. And then, once again, it's clearing the, uh, querying the DOM for an element with an ID of foo, and it's adding a width. And then, once again, querying the DOM for an element with an ID of foo, and triggering a click event. So, my mom has a term for this. She says, whoever wrote this code is unclear on the concept. Um, so, this is untrustworthy code. Um, so, one way that you can make it better, obviously, is you can cache your jQuery selector, and you can um, call your methods from that cache jQuery selector. So, uh, you're not querying the DOM multiple times. But of course, even better would be to take advantage of jQuery's method chaining. Um, query the DOM once and chain your methods. So the first example is untrustworthy code. The, sec the last example is when you see that, you can tell whoever wrote this code actually knew what they were doing. So this is an example of a code smell. If you haven't heard this term before, um, a code smell is a symptom of the source code of a program that possibly indicates that um, smelly code is the code that you look at and you see it. You say, oh, there's going to be bugs in this code. Whoever wrote this didn't know what they were doing. Um, so building a style guide will help you get rid of these smells. 
Some smells include uh, high conditional complexity, uh, mixed match white space, long methods, long parameter lists, the type of stuff that you look at your code and you just say, this isn't good. Um, and it also brings me to this concept of the broken windows effect. Um, in, in civics, the broken windows effect is you go into a neighborhood and there's broken windows, there's garbage on the floor, uh, maybe there's graffiti, and you get the feeling that there that the neighborhood hasn't been cared for. Um, it's possible that the crime rates are higher. When when you go into that neighborhood, I, I know none of us would do this, but you might be one might be more inclined to throw the garbage on the ground because they see that other people have already done that. So the idea is that crime begets crime. And that translates to uh, us as developers in that smelly code begets smelly code. So you want to make your code trustworthy so your code doesn't smell. <laughs> um, so say you come to back to your code base the next day and you see that somebody has gone in and diligently followed the patterns already set out by a uh, previous developer and they've once again put the DOM for that element foo and added CSS um, and some text to it. This reminds me of a famous non-George Bush quote. <laughs> Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I got it right. Um, <laughs> uh, so as leaders and concerned citizens, it's our responsibility to provide good tools to keep our machines well oiled. So what do we do? We create rules. Um, and this is the uh, excerpt from our actual staff guide. It's hosted on um, GitHub. You can go to it at any time. Uh, so this is the rule. Uh, reduce the number of DOM queries by caching jQuery objects if the same object will be used more than once. Also, prefix jQuery objects with a variable of dollar sign. So as you can see, there's a bad example and a good example. Um, so with this rule, we've actually gone a step further and said if you have a jQuery object, prefix it with a dollar sign. And so when the new developer is coming and looking at that code, they don't have to go back and see, oh, what kind of object is this? They'll see that dollar sign as a know that it's a jQuery object, thus making their code more trustworthy. Another example of a code smell is this max parameters issue. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen this before. You have a method and you have your parameters and all of a sudden, so your method is make, make image, and now your product manager wants you to add um, an attribution to your image. So you have added by, you add that on to the end. And now, you, it turns out that the width, height, order, and type, those were, um, those were optional, but it, you, you now you have to have your, um, your added by in there. And so you end up with this crazy system where you have to, I find myself going in and counting the quote, 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 to make sure that I've lined up all of my parameters correctly. This is smelly code. What you can do to make it better is pass an option into your function. Um, and then you can just pass in the parameters that you need. So we have gone in and made a rule. Um, function should have no more than four parameters. If more than four are needed, create an object that contains the parameters and pass that object to the function. If you're ever doing a code review, all you have to do is link to this section of your style guide, and I guarantee you that developer will never make this mistake again. Okay, here's a, a fun one, bar hoisting. Uh, raise your hand if you know bar hoisting enough that you thought, feel you could explain it to a room full of people. Okay, come on, explain it. I'm just kidding, sit down. <laughs> um, so, the point is it's, it's fairly complicated and, and most, uh, especially early age uh, JavaScript developers, aren't going to know all of the details of bar hoisting. But they don't have to because what you can do is set up a rule to make it so that everything will work out as expected. Um, I'll give it a try explaining bar hoisting. Basically what's happening in this function is you're defining, bar, uh, you're defining your variable foo and then you're entering, you're entering your function scope of the function bar. You're checking if not foo, set foo to 10, um, and then alert foo. So what's actually happening here is that the JavaScript engine is interpreting this as the declaration of foo is happening at the top of the function, and then foo actually doesn't exist. 
So, because um, it's undefined. So it does step through the time, and then time gets loaded. Um, so that's basic bar hoisting. But if you have a rule to always put your variable declarations at the top of your function, then you'll never have to explain this to anybody ever again. Um, so here's our rule. Declare all variables using one bar keyword at the top of the scope context. Um, we decided to go with one bar keyword as opposed to bar, multiple bar statements. That's just a style issue that you can decide on your own. However, I suggest you pick one and keep it consistent. Um, so the summary there is that you want to be able to trust your code and by creating these roles, making them readily available on GitHub or any sort of internal tool um, will help you get to the point where your code is a lot more trustworthy. All right, the uh, second key principle I want to talk about is don't reinvent the wheel. I'm sure you've heard that before, but um, it turns out other people have done this before. Wikia is not the first organization to create a JavaScript style here. So um, where this manifested for us is, is in the tools that we uh, use to, to make our code compliant. And what we actually did wrong was first we wrote all the rules, and then we looked at the tools. And this brings me to the topic of our conversation, frickin' white space. Ironically, white space was the most, most controversial aspect of the style guide process, um, which is pretty amazing to me. Um, but this is what happened. We decided to go with a well-known uh, white space convention. We chose jQueries. And uh, jQuery prescribes that you put a space um, in between your parentheses and your parameters in your function calls. Um, it looks good, it's easy to read, it's great. Um, but here's the problem, is that part of the conventions are that if you have a function or an array as the last parameter, um, don't put a space in between the, uh, the last parameter and the ending uh, parentheses. And it makes a lot of sense to do that, however, it's an exception, and a lot of style checkers out there won't account for this type of exception. And we could have created our own tools to, to check for this sort of thing, but f why, for who, for what? Why don't you just use the tools that are out there? Don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, so we actually adopted this convention and then came across these problems and then had to change. So we, we changed to MediaWiki um, because that was what our platform is. Um, and MediaWiki didn't have that exception, which was nice, however, Putting that extra space in there is actually super annoying if you've ever done it, and it doesn't look good. Um, also, there's an uh, aspect of the MediaWiki coding convention where the uh, accessing array uh, items, you, uh, you don't put a space in there, and, and, tool, and uh, JavaScript code sniffers were, they couldn't handle this case um, while you were also putting spaces in your function calls. They just, it didn't, there wasn't out there. Um, so what we did was we found JS Lint. <laughs> um, and I'm being a little uh, silly here by making it seem like it's a, a godsend, but it really is a, a great tool. Um, we had passed up JS Lint at first uh, due to its strictness. I'm sure if you've heard of JS Lint, you've heard that it's a very strict tool. But there are lots of great redeeming qualities. Um, so just a little background about JS Lint. It was created by Douglas Crockford in 2002. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Douglas Crockford, he's the guy that discovered JSON. He didn't uh, create it, but he created the spec. He says that JSON existed in the wild already. Um, but at the time he was uh, writing JS Lint, it was 2002. It was the wild west of JavaScript. Uh, Mozilla 1.1 had just come out. Uh, Netscape was still widely supported. And IE6 was the gold standard of browsers. So we were in need of a JavaScript style guide back then. So what he did was he separated his style guide into two sec sections, style rules and language rules. And this is actually what we did as well, because it makes a lot of sense. So style rules are um, rules that help us write easy to read, well-documented, and consistent code. And language rules have an actual impact on functionality. They can help prevent bugs um, and increase performance. So the way that Douglas Crockford went about 
setting up his J.S. Lint style rules are that he made them work the way that we read English. So for example, a space goes after a comma or a colon, not before. Uh, space, you put a space after keywords like if and while and for, so it reads like English. Um, he also said no spaces between a function and the invoking parentheses, just so that you can couple those two items together so it makes sense logically when you look at it. And he actually used this example in one of his talks that I found very interesting, so I'm just going to shamelessly recreate it here. Uh, this is an example of the way that the Roman alphabet used to be before they introduced white space and punctuation. So I'll read this because I know it's hard to read. Back in the day, the Romans didn't use spaces or punctuation, and misunderstandings arose, so they had to introduce these conventions into their writing. Um, okay, so now I've put some spaces in there. Still kind of hard to read. The spaces don't mean anything. They're inconsistent. <laughs> they actually don't help very much. So the whole point is that your spaces and your punctuation have to actually make sense and help the reader in understanding. So the second half of the, the conventions um, include language rules. Um, and this is just a, a quote from Douglas Crockford. If there's a feature of a language that is sometimes problematic and it can be replaced with another feature that is more reliable, then always use that more reliable feature. A good example of this will be the var, ho var hoisting example that I used earlier. Due to JavaScript's eccentricities, there's, um, you know, issues can arise when you don't put your var statements at the top of your function scope. So that's um, just an example of a way to avoid bugs. Here's another one, this EQEQ uh, rule, which is another wonderful thing about JavaScript. It's loosely typed. So if you have a Boolean check like foo equals equals zero, foo can actually be quote, quote, false, zero. You don't actually know what foo is. So if you put a strict type checking in there, foo equals 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 zero, you actually know that foo is in fact an integer zero. So uh, another thing about JS Lint um, is that there was a uh, study done on popular coding conventions based on the last six months of check-ins on open source repositories in GitHub. And the findings were very interesting. So they uh, compared check-ins that put their commas last versus commas first, and it turns out that 93% of these check-ins put their commas last. And guess what? JS Lint says to put your commas last. Oops. Okay, um, spaces versus tabs for indentation purposes. Uh, it turns out that 80% of these check-ins used spaces, and guess what JS Lint prescribes? Spaces. Oops, I keep pushing up, push down, okay. Um, functions followed by one space versus functions followed by no space. 67% said functions followed by one space. Again, JS Lint prescribes this. Another one, this is the one that we came across. Arguments defined with one space versus zero spaces. 94% of these check-ins had no spaces in their argument um, lists. So that was pretty telling. Object literal definition types, you get the idea. 63% um, uh, define their uh, object literals with spaces following the colon. Same with conditional, space, uh, conditional statements, putting a space after the if keyword. Also, JS Lint prescribes this. It makes sense in English. Okay, single versus double quotes. 56% prescribe single quotes and 43% prescribe double quotes. Which do you think JS Lint prescribes? It actually doesn't specify which I find interesting because this is the closest ratio out of any of these items surveyed. Um, I have chosen single quotes, or our team chose single quotes because of the extra, well, you, you don't have to hit shift before um, your quote, um, which I would speculate others have decided to, which is why single quotes are slightly more popular, but I find it very telling that, that since JS Lint doesn't prescribe this, the ratio is so much tighter. 
Um, so GSLIN is great. It's commonly used, it works. New employees might already be familiar with it. Uh, some of the tools that I'll discuss later actually have configurations like JSLint Happy. <laughs> um, and there's also something called JS Hint, which is a, a fork of JSLint, which is actually what you should use instead of JSLint, and I'll get to that in a minute. So uh, my third key principle is that programmers are lazy. Good programmers are anyway. And good, good lazy programmers are expensive, and we need to streamline their work environments. And we need to give them the tools to uh, make sure that they don't have to worry about coding conventions all the time. They can just make them happen naturally. And so the tools that our organization decided upon are JS Hint, JS Beautify, and JS CS. And I will go over those in a minute. Um, but the basic idea of, of this is that it should be harder for us to fail than to succeed. Uh, we should be able to run our tools in pre-commit hooks and use IDE plugins, use things that automatically update our white space for us, like JS Beautify. There's uh, quality checkers like Code Climate and Plato. So these tools, um, JS Hint is a great one. It was created by Anton Kovalyov, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering that name, in, in 2010. It's a fork of JS Lint. And it's a community-driven tool, so people can submit pull requests on GitHub. And it's far more configurable and more forgiving than JSLint. To give you an idea of the reasons that JS Hint was created, here's a nice quote from Douglas Crockford. Your sadly pathetic bleedings are harshing my mellow. Here's another one from good old Douglas Crockford. That code is insanely stupid. I'm not going to dumb down JS min, min for this case. So granted, this, so this is an actual GitHub commit that he, he posted, um, or GitHub comment. Uh, granted, the, the, the code he was talking about was insanely stupid, but you get the idea for his propensity for um, strictness and his lack of desire to conform his tools to your desires. Um, so JS hint. Uh, you can go to jshint.com. There is a uh, web interface that you can use. There's a, config a ton of configuration options. You can run it on the command line. Your IDE probably supports it. Um, you can, there's a config for it that just lives in the root of your directory, and your IDE will read that. The command line tools will read that. Online uh, quality checkers like uh, Code Climate will read it. And there's a handy dandy option to ignore a line if you so need to. Another tool that we found to be extremely useful is JS Beautify. As I mentioned, our code base was a bit of a mess, and we also went back and forth with different coding conventions. So once we introduced JS Beautify and its JS Lint happy parameter, all of our white space worries were gone. You could, uh, every time anyone updated any legacy JavaScript file, all they had to do was run JS Beautify on it, and it would automatically conform to our white space conventions. Um, remember, developers are lazy. They need these tools. They don't want to be sitting there entering white space here and there. And, and moreover, you don't want them developing their own tools to enter that white space. You want it to just be available for them. Um, and also it has a, con a config that you can set up however you want, and it lives in the root directory of your application. And JSCS is also really great. It is a complement for JS Hint. It, it checks a lot of things that JS Hint doesn't check. Um, so things like requiring curly braces and requiring space after keywords. Um, I'm not actually sure if JS Hint checks those, but regardless, they're, they're complements to uh, JS Hint. And if you ever find that there is uh, something that JS Hint does check and JS CS doesn't, or no, if they both check the same thing, go with JS Hint because JS Hint has the ignore clause and JS CS doesn't. But I still find them both to be extremely valuable tools. Uh, Code Climate is a, another really great tool. It's a hosted solution and it gives you a grade for your code. And it will actually email me if anybody checks in code that is below a C or a D or a C. Um, and what's great about that is that 
Imagine you get an email from your coding conventions lead saying your code just received an F. Um, that's gonna, and then a screenshot or a link to the, the, the page, that's gonna whip you into shape pretty quickly and moreover, it's gonna make you think that somebody's checking over your shoulder and watching you. And so even if I'm not, they still think that I am. So they, uh, they get it, they get it pretty quick. Um, so that's really nice. This is our actual GPA, <laughs> which is a 2.06, which isn't that great. Um, but we're really working on it and you can tell that um, we actually have this GPA now so we can, in so we can increase it over time. Um, uh, to our defense, there's a lot of third-party code that we haven't fully excluded from this checker, so maybe if I go in and, and do more of that, then it'll improve. Um, but just to give you an idea of the kind of information that Code Climate gives you, these things might not seem that bad, um, like this line is too long, but if you're ever in GitHub trying to do a code review, then you have to scroll to the right to see what's going on in that side of the, the page. It's just, it's pointless. You wanna just give yourself some line breaks. Um, same thing with the use strict statement. Um, these are the kind of things that Code Climate will check and they'll fail you for, <laughs> which is harsh, but, but great at the same time. Uh, there's also a tool called Plato, which is, um, you can just check out a Git repo of it and host it yourself. So if that's something you prefer, then it's available to you. We went with uh, Code Climate because of the, the ease of use and the fact that it will just email me without me thinking about it. But Plato is also a great tool uh, that I suggest anybody interested in that have a look at. Uh, so that takes me to the end of my JavaScript coding conventions discussion. But while we're here, we're all probably front end coding or front end developers, and CSS is an important part of our job that often gets overlooked. So I just want to go over briefly a little bit about SCSS coding conventions. Um, we use SCSS. Whatever preprocessor you use, these conventions will probably be, probably be the same for you. So. When we finished our JavaScript coding conventions, we moved on to SCSS with all of the knowledge we gained from doing the JavaScript version. So what we did was we first looked at the tools that were out there and then decided what rules we wanted to make. It turns out that causes.com has created a great tool called SCSS Lint that has a, a huge list of configuration options that some of which we hadn't even thought about, uh, but we were able to model our style guide based on those. So it checks things like alphabetizing your properties. Imagine going into your, uh, S, your, CSS, uh, doc, or your CSS files and seeing that all of your properties are alphabetized. That, that, that feels good. You can check more easily for duplicate selectors. Um, SCSS lint checks for white space issues and selector depth, which is a big one. And just like in any coding language, there is smelly CSS. So, Here's an example of some smelly CSS that you want to look out for and that SCS lint actually checks for. Uh, duplicate properties like margin um, is declared as 10 pixels and then at the bottom it's declared as zero. That's, that's, it looks like somebody didn't care for this code. Um, somebody was careless or somebody thinks that it's a 10 pixel margin and really it's a zero margin and that's a bug. So um, SCSS ch lint checks for that. Of course, if you're handling different browser issues, then it is lenient on that, which is great. If you see a rule that's just completely empty, why? <laughs> why have that in your code? You wanna get rid of that. And again, you don't wanna scan your own code for things like this. You want the tools that will just check it and, and fix it for you. This is litter. This is pure litter in your code. This is broken windows. Um, an ID with an extraneous selector. This is another example of unclear on the concept. You have one submit button in your page, you don't need to give it a class of button. So again, SCSS lint will check for things like this. Over specificity and selector depth. There's a common misconception with these preprocessors that you can just set up your CSS to look like your HTML structure. This is completely unnecessary. This, this wrapper, wrapper inner, UL, LI, submit button, that compiles down to what you see below, which is this crazy specific selector that you probably don't need. Probably all you need is dot wrapper dot submit button. 
So there is, um, there's a oh sorry, there's a rule about that, which is um, you should determine what level of selector depth you find to be reasonable in your code base. The default for SCSS lint is three, three selectors. Um, we went with four just because we didn't want to kill ourselves by with all of our legacy code. So we just went with four, and it works out fine. It's way better than five or six or seven. There is also a really great tool called Analyze CSS that will analyze the output of your uh, your, your CSS, regardless of the preprocessor you use. Uh, it was created by Mockbray, this guy that actually works for Wikia, but it works on a lot of open source projects. So this is an open source project. Um, it, uh, what's really great is that it checks for things like duplicate rules due to mix-ins. Um, it can be hard sometimes managing a large code base with lots of mix-ins. You can find that rules get duplicated regardless of the care that you pay. Um, so it's, it's really great for managing these large code, large code bases and checking for issues. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys a list of resources that we found to be extremely useful. We looked at Google's style guide, at Airbnb's style guide, all of the Douglas Crockford uh, resources. Um, and like I said, you can check out this Git repository from my, uh, from my Git. And so you can have all of this available to you. There's some other resources like talks about, from Douglas Crawford that are always entertaining. Um, and are there any questions? Yeah. So you were saying to run uh, JS Beautify against legacy JS code? Well, yeah. Yeah, it does. I think it's, a, it's an okay price to pay in the end. It, what, what we found that works well is that um, to actually do a separate commit for any style changes like this so that whatever code work you're actually doing is, is separated and that makes it a lot easier for code review to happen. So <laughs> I've, had, I've not done that before and I have to find myself annotating my, my git pull request and saying, this is the actual fix. And, and here, here, this is the actual fix and in midst of a sea of white space changes. So, so yeah, it does change your, your SBN history, but I think the quality is, um, the benefit outweighs the, the negative. Go ahead. We did, yeah. We, um, we actually set up some rules about commenting. Um, basically, JS doc style comments above functions and then inline comments everywhere else. So the only time we use slash star is for a description of a function. Um, and everywhere else, even if it is a multi-line comment, we decided that we want to just use slash slash, slash for, to denote that it's an inline comment. But um, so yeah, I highly recommend setting up comment rules as well. Did you, um, when you were looking at um, those uh, popular code check-ins on GitHub, did you did it give a comment? Did you come up with comments that were more popular than others? It didn't, t I didn't t discuss comments. I actually went through all of the things that that particular study looked into, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what's up? Absolutely, yeah. So we set, um, there's some, something called conditional complexity and we set a rule regarding that. Um, I believe it's something like four, I don't think we went up to five, but levels of complexity in your uh, functions. Code Climate actually does do that. And um, it's possible that, J I think JS Hint also does that, I'd have to check, but Code Climate does, which is great. Yeah. Yeah, what's up? Um, regarding the, the JS Beautify and the uh, SVN commit history and so on, you said that the key benefits always drawbacks. And I mean, aside from just you know having cleaner white space, uh, did you find any other benefits like in terms of maintenance or anything like that? For me personally, when I'm searching through the code, sometimes I like to know the amount of white space that surrounds a keyword. If it's something like the word skin, 
um, and I'm looking for the word skin as a parameter. I can search for skin with white space next to it versus skin without white space next to it. So, so sometimes it's really helpful in that regard, um, but it really does boil down to the broken windows effect and just knowing that your code is gonna be consistent, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so at my uh, work, we mostly use PHP Storm because we're a PHP stack. Um, and so one of the things that I did that was actually really helpful for people was I went in and set up my conventions in my, in my IDE, and then I exported them so that they could just import them. Um, so that was actually really nice. And then um, for any other IDEs, if there were people that could champion the cause for, um, for, their, other, for, for their different ones. But uh, most of them do have these plugins for things like JS Hint especially. Um, so that's extremely helpful. You have to decide what works best for you. Um, we do. We use AMD, and so we want to. We use AMD, so every document that we have is one module, one, one AMD module, um, and so you can set up rules for things like lines of code, but that's not necessarily the best. Um, but it, I, I do highly recommend you set up rules for what your company needs. Um, and for, for the types of things to look out for. For instance, don't have a, a module that handles too many issues. Um, we like to split our code via MVC, so we have views that, you know, that are only concerned with, with display logic and then um, controllers and, and, and routing and different things like that. So, so whatever makes sense for your company, I think it's important that you talk to your coworkers and find out what that is. Yeah. How do you manage external vendor files with Micronic compliant with some of these uh, style guides? Um, ignore directives. So JS Lint, or sorry, JS Hint has a way that you can ignore whole directories. Uh, Code Climate does as well. So yeah, ignore, ignore, ignore. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about those. Like, 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 I think that's bringing down our GPAs because I haven't fully ignored all the third-party code. But you absolutely do not want to update them because that'll be a nightmare for upgrading later on. Any more questions? Okay, well, I'll be around if any. Oh, did you have another one? Just, uh, do you have a word for JS Mint? JS um, I don't actually know what we use. I never have worked on that aspect of our code, um, so I couldn't recommend one way or the other. Sorry. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, well thank you very much. <laughs>